Hi everybody, my name is uh, Robert Moreau. Um, I work for the company called White Whale Analytics. Anybody ever heard of White Whale Analytics? White Whale? Nice. Um, so we're a company that specializes in machine learning and AI solutions. We have uh, end to end data analytics platform. We work in spaces such as energy, that's a big one for us, health and wellness. Um, we've worked in uh, Department of Defense uh, and then pro sports, things like NHL and, and stuff like that. Um, I was going to present something a bit different today because a lot of what I do is um, you know, we really thinking about machine intelligence and trying to strip away some of the things that um, aren't, necess aren't necessary for every problem, but try and get at the core of what does all of these problems have in common. And uh, from my background in physics, there's this uh, big overlap I noticed with this concept of entropy. Has anybody ever heard that word, entropy? Um, and there's just this enormous overlap between fields, and it's not a coincidence of why this is. Um, I'm going to try and tell a coherent story, and at the end of it, it's either going to be uh, high entropy or low entropy in here, meaning you're either going to know what I've said or it's not going to make any sense, and I'll feel a lot of shame. Um, the first concept is this idea of our connected universe. What is it? It's just like as it sounds. What are some axioms or logical ways of thinking about information that actually connect our universe in ways that we don't necessarily think of? When we think about connection, we think about a force like a chain or a rope or gravity. Uh, but there's other ways that things are interconnected. Um, you know, what is entropy, or at least in the context of this, what do we mean by when we say entropy? What is emergence? That might be a new word. It's not a, a one that's used that much. And how does this relate to intelligence, both human intelligence and artificial intelligence? So we start really early on, uh, the Big Bang. And so this is just the first thing that popped out on Google. There is some differences when you look about how big the Big Bang was. Some people say it's like seven centimeters. Some people say it's like an apple. It's all pretty close. Um, this one, though, would be my favorite. It's very, very tiny. And it's saying that the entire observable universe, everything, including all of us right now, um, really started in this really tiny, tiny point, all the information in the universe. And when you think about something that small, it itself is almost its own entity. You think about a grain of rice, it's something. We're something, we're a lot bigger. So this is like something, it's like an entity. And it has a whole bunch of information inside of it. Um, it's unified, it's all in one place. Everything is so close, everything's interacting. Um, and the idea behind, that I, the first thing I think about is, okay, so it's this thing that has got a whole bunch of stuff inside of it. Let's assume there's nothing outside of it. Its contents over time can't actually change. And the way that I think about this is you think about jelly beans, right? So you have a jar of jelly beans, and it's got five red and five blue jelly beans in it. And then all of a sudden, you look at it, you see where all the jelly beans are, you shake it up and you look inside, and they're not in the same place that they used to be, but there's still five blue and five red jelly beans. So it makes sense, it's like things got a little, more uncertain, you don't know where they are, but at least it's all there. If you had opened the jar and there were 10 M&Ms in there, it wouldn't really make sense, right? It, it sort of betrays this very logical axiom we have. It's logical as addition. It's that something changed without interacting with something outside of it. And so really when you think about um, what this really means, is sort of this idea of this conservation of something, maybe energy. It's this way that um, regardless of what goes on inside, the context over time, that must remain the same. It can look a lot different, it can spread out really far, but at the end of the day, all these bits of information are still there, they interact, they may look differently, but it wouldn't make sense if the universe came back together and had M&Ms instead of jelly beans, right? Um, and another thing about this too is now I imagine one more time, we have a big jar of jelly beans, it's got, you know, this time it's got a thousand jelly beans in it. You drop the jar, it breaks, and the jelly beans go everywhere. Well, if you think about it, it was a lot simple. It was a lot more simple before because if somebody asked you where, you know, where was the tenth jelly bean, you'd say it was in the jar. But now that it's everywhere, it's very hard to, to tell, and you have to look in a lot of places to find it. And this is the way that information works: is that information can actually disseminate. It can go to different places, and it's still all there, but you have to collect more. And this is why AI cannot be more relevant because it can look through all this information, right, and tell what it all adds up to. Um, one of the fundamental ideas in science is that things are axiomatically uh, the same everywhere, everywhere else in the universe. So one of the big principles is, is that when we make an observation in space, whatever science that explains it, we have to be able to do on Earth, even in deep space, right? And so we're already, uh, the very principle of science sort of acts accordingly in that everything, no matter where we go in the universe, behaves the same way. The way that things interact, the way that information exchanges, and so, in a way, this is the universe's secret way of telling us that 
it has to agree on things everywhere it is. Information has to interact the same way. And even though we're really far away from something, the physics over there is the same as it is here. And in my eyes, this is the way of making sure that jelly beans stay jelly beans, right? They can do different things, they can go different places, but along the way, something has to be aware of that. And we're all tied together in this agreement. So it doesn't matter where you go, um, the laws of information, the laws of entropy hold true. The, the conservation of energy and the second law of thermodynamics. So, sorry, I'm gonna take a sip of water. Um, the entropy, what is it, is a cooler word for uncertainty. And if there's one thing that physics have the knack for, it's finding the coolest word for whatever you want. Um, you know, I saw quantum toothpaste at the mall. It's, that's how cool the words are. You just put on toothpaste or quantum wine, it, it exists. So it's a cool word for uncertainty. And so when something is high entropy, we say we're more uncertain of it, right? So, you know, I, I shuffle eight decks of cards and I say, what's the first one that's gonna come out? It's a high entropy problem, right? In which deck of cards did it come out of? Um, low entropy is when we are more certain of something. So like your phone number, hopefully, is a low entropy thing where you just know what your phone number is. You have pretty good confidence with it. No? Um, uh, and then this might be a little, it's not meant to come across as something philosophical, but in a lot of ways we can say that zero entropy can be thought of as truth. Absolute, uh, getting rid of, eliminating all uncertainty. So to become truly certain of something. So entropy has this interesting connection too, both in real life and in physics, uh, where the, it, it correlates to efficiency. This makes sense, right? So if something's very uncertain and very chaotic, it's probably inefficient. So we didn't have lines at the airport, which is in Greece right now, uh, they actually, it was pretty bad, but, they, but it's true. And so if you don't have order, it becomes inefficient. Um, an example of this is, is gravity. How does gravity relate entropy, certainty, and in, in inefficiency? Uh, gravity is something that's really certain, right? So when you drop something, it falls straight down every single time. You can keep trying this, trying this, and trying this, and it's very unlikely it's ever gonna go up. And because, so it's incredibly certain. But at the same time, when you pick something up and you lift it up, you put it somewhere, every little bit of energy that it took to put, move the thing upwards is conserved. It, it's not like these things where, we, where you know, it's inefficient, we lose energy in, in engines. You know, there's all kinds of, every kind of process, solar processes. We lose energy, but not gravity. Um, and gravity is the most certain. Uh, communication, so you know, speaking the same language, it makes things a lot easier. Uh, trying to come up, like uh, in a presentation, communication, makes it or breaks it. Uh, <laughs> passwords, so here's another thing. So you think about every cybersecurity protocol in the world that revolves around a password. What is, why, why do passwords work? Because it is so high entropy for anybody else or uncertain of what your password is, they can't break it. But then once you know your password, everything becomes very efficient, right? Stress, I think that one of the, not the only, but definitely a big contributor to stress and, and everyone can probably relate this is the idea of uncertainty. It's come across different times of life. What are we going to do when we're older? What are we doing now? You know, um, there's a number of ways where uncertainty. If you don't know what's going to happen, it gives this feeling of helplessness. Safety. Um, look at the. Why do we get on an airplane? We don't get on an airplane because we're 99% certain that it's everything's going to be okay. We get on an airplane because we're 99.999999% certain that it's going to be okay, right? So that's why we can efficiently travel. Um, beliefs in things, and again, not in a, necessarily the philosophical sense, but beliefs can sometimes codify things and you can make our decision making very simple, where we don't have to evaluate everything because it goes against beliefs. And this can be more true for companies. So this is an exercise, and I didn't know if it was something where we just get somebody to shout something out or everybody wants to take a minute to talk to somebody next to them. We have a lot of people, so statistically, someone's either gonna do one or either, so. Um, what is the greatest sources of entropy in your personal life. And the idea is, is that you think about this and it's like, where does uncertainty come in? And you want to show it out? You want to talk to our partner? Who's brave? No. Your wife? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Oh, well, don't make me go. The future. Oh, I, oh you're, you're tripping everyone out. Um, the future, it's a perfect example. So, and I think this could be more common than a machine learning when we want to make a forecast on something. Which way is my investment going to go? How much oil am I going to make this year? What is the weather doing? How much rain are we going to have? So the future is a very big one, and this is exactly one of the biggest places I can speak from the things that we've built. The future is, is very important. 
tell me which way it's going to go. What, what about anything else? Greatest sources of entropy, yeah, the future? Absolutely. It's easy to, to remember the past, hopefully. Okay, next one. Any, unless we have anybody else who's itching. Other no. People. Other, other people. people. That's a fantastic example. It's uh, what's really remarkable. You think about people the way we work is we're constantly in communication with each other, changing, you know, sending information in strange ways. And at the end of the day, it's very difficult to understand what everyone was thinking. Uh, so what about uh, business and work? So bring it into like something where if AI, if one of the fundamental purposes of AI is to reduce entropy in our lives, to give us certainty when we need it, get diagnostic predictions, you name it. So where is some uncertainty in work? And we can look at the, you know, regionally, there's things with oil and gas. Maybe we'd like to know more about, like maybe we did want to know more about a pipeline. If I'll go, that would be nice to know. Replacement by AI. Yeah. <laughs> Replacement by AI, uh, that doesn't count. No. <laughs> well, that, but that's, that's the a really good point, right? Um, and I think that my goal is by the end of this presentation is that that is not a, a fear at all. Um, when we see, uh, yeah, I can't spoil the rest of it, but. <laughs> so, one point, uh, so if my AI model doesn't work because of poor quality data, I will lose my job tomorrow. Yeah. That's very true, yeah. So, um, being sure that you are dealing with high fidelity data that contains the information you need, you need to be certain of that. The kind of the reverse problem is your company provides a service to an audience or a set of customers that may or may choose to arbitrarily say, we're not interested or we found a better source. And therefore, your company has to respond to this lack of cash in. That's, that's an uncertainty. Yeah. Are, we, are we doing the right things? Yeah. Right, is a big one. Are we building the right thing? Are we servicing the right things? Are we in the right space? Um, yeah, no, the way we think about these things, and they'll kind of resurface later on, but I want you to think of something that's we call like a crystal ball question. So it's a question of this nature. It's not like you get a wish, but you got to know something. And it's like a crystal ball question. And the key to successful AI or analytics is knowing what that question is. Because you could be the best at something else and not ask the right question, and the value that it delivers is minimal in comparison. And so this is one thing we want to do is what is what should we focus on? And the example I give, you just inherited a house from like your long-lost uncle, right? And you know you have to sell it. So you get to ask one question, and what's that question? You know, it could be, well, am I going to have things done in time to sell? Who's the best realtor to use? Is there going to be a natural disaster here next year? Or what's the price of real estate in 10 years on this property? And those things might really help with the decision. Or what are the best one? When do I sell? Right? Emergence. So emergence occurs when an entity is observed to have properties its parts do not have on their own. So this is a phenomenon of what we talk about, that interconnectedness of information and things that can take on properties. Um, let's give a few examples of it. Riding a bike. So when you ride a bike, your legs are doing this, right? But it's only when you combine you with the bike that all of a sudden you get this forward smooth motion, right? The property is, is emergent. It comes from you and something else. But in better ways, Darwinism, here's a good one. So think about a giraffe for a minute, right? And a really tall giraffe. So the idea is, is that the really tall giraffe is living the longest because it gets the highest leaves, right? But is it getting the highest leaves because of its height, or is it getting it because all the other giraffes are shorter, right? And it's this theory that things can have macro states, they can have macroscopic influences from everything else that give you certain properties, right? And we'll go through a few of them. Um, whoops. Financial markets, supply and demand. That's like a perfect example, right? Supply and demand. So basically, the value of somebody, the perceived value has to do with its rarity, its scarcity, and how many people actually want it. You can have something very scarce, but no one wants it. And it's, it's all in relative balance to itself. Democracy, right? Another great example. Uh, you know, in theory, uh, leaders are, reflect the choices of everybody else and their beliefs. Game theory. I mean, you can't have a game theory without having the emergence happen. I mean, it wouldn't be game theory if it was just one thing. Uh, media, and this is probably the most powerful, I guess, uh, you know, telescope for the world to look, to look at emergent phenomena. It is basically where we can see all of the, you know, all of the main issues, all the information, breaking news, things like that. So these are all emergent phenomena, but the reason that they're important is because we have to keep this idea in our mind that data and information means things, and, and it has real, uh, emergent effects 
on what is happening. So if you measure the right variables and they're part of this, I guess, immersive cycle or these immersive, immersive fo uh, forces, this is why we can trust um, AI. So in my the way that we look at it is understanding emergence is a key to reducing entropy. Understanding how things interact on the overall state of things, this lets us predict what's going to happen next. So it's a, it's a matter of looking at how all the information comes together to paint that picture. And uh, what we really do with AI is we're applying pattern detection, uh, detection to recognize these net emergence effects. So you're talking about oil and gas. Well, how much steam and pump and pressure do I need to actually achieve the most oil and gas? Is this emergent phenomena? It's what are the values of everything else? If you're going to look at to increase retention you know, in a YMCA, the things you're going to be looking for are what are the macroscopic properties of people coming in? When do they like to come in? What do they take? What do they have in common? And if you look at it all together, um, what does this tell us about when and where something should be and when we offer it? Um, so exercise two, what emergent forces have the greatest impact on your life? <laughs> Diet. Diet. And that is a very emergent, yeah, absolutely. I heard climate, somebody mentioned climate before, things like that. Um, we don't seem to know, explain all that stuff, but we know that it's an emergent force, and we know that it has a lot of uh, factors to it. Money. Money, exactly. Money is only, is a, is a completely emergent, uh, in the sense that, you know, what is wealth, right? It's having more than everybody else. Um, and then what can you buy with wealth? Well, it's the things that other people provide you with. It's, it's completely connected. Knowledge. Knowledge. Lifestyle. Lifestyle. Family, that's number one. There's this system being referred to as the economy. It's called the economy all the time. Yeah, yeah, it's like the universe of yeah, emergence. <laughs> um, and then what about most often? So maybe not the greatest, but which ones do we, you know, it could be the, well, for example, the economic uh, conditions locally, right? So it might not be the greater scale of the economy. It could be things that affect Calgarians. It could be weather, right? Uh, it can just be things like, you know, it's so impressive to have everybody here tonight in support of the text scene in Calgary because I think it's an incredibly promising scene. But it's things like that, right, where we, we, we work with, against these other emergent forces, these other places, right, that, that in a lot of ways there's a lot of competition out there. And uh, I think that it affects the text scene big here because we're going up against a lot. Um, so without defining what, or me believing that I know what intelligence is, I do think that it has something to do with the ability to understand emergence. And why do I think that? Because um, there's a difference between something that's intelligent and something that's complicated, right? So complexity is different than intelligence. It has to have this, this extra defining feature. So an example I give is the number of pi. Number of pi is irrational. So it has more digits than we have particles in the universe, right? So its complexity is enormous, but would we say pi has intelligence? Um, you know, we give it another one, you know, chess again. Played by incredibly intelligent people, but is the game itself encompass intelligence? No, so it can't just be complex complexity. It can't just be mechanics of an algorithm. It has to have some defining feature to it. And what I believe is it's uh, the ability to identify emergent phenomena. And if you think about it, it's like, that's really what AI does. You look at all the great examples of what it's doing, um, like in what Microsoft just showed, a whole bunch of different things, determining context of stuff from words, that's emergence. Looking at all these different words, what do they all mean? Looking at different features of people, right? Uh, detecting sound. And so really what it's doing is, uh, is in each one of these cases, it's AI introduced to a certain level of information. So sound, right? Images, it could just be data, data in a table. And this is the limit to it. So we talked about AI, and, and is it going to replace us? It, can, it can't. It it's lives in this very narrow universe uh, of, the, of the information it's given. And there's, it has a place in the, where it looks at data in you know, large volumes and can find patterns in these things that people can't trivially. But at the end of the day, if you think about a computer um, running a SEGD oil gas field, it's reading only one table of information to do all that. But that's because it's finding the emergent phenomena in this little table, right? But now we think about people, right? What do people do? Well, consciousness is the highest form of this intelligent awareness. It means that what the information we're preview to is what you have to all of our senses, right? So we are able to communicate, uh, we're able to hear, sight, sound, 
all these different things that we can take in on information process, right? Um, and it all comes into one avenue, and we're able to distill, I guess, or understand or detect emergent ph phenomena that is so far greater, like so much greater than what a computer detects, because it lives, it, it only has so little information, right? And we're able to do all this like a giant supercomputer. Um, last exercise. So this is another one that I think, bringing it back to AI. This is how we think about it: is what if you basically had a crystal ball? It gives you a truthful answer to every question, which means whatever, it's, it's right, right? Um, you can ask it the same question every single day. What question, or that's just a question, do you ask it? And I think that um, if you have a good answer to that question, and it's an answer that can scale, that's an AI application, right? Because the next step of that is what information or forces of immersion are most relevant to your question? So basically, okay, now you know what the question is. That's the most important thing. Now, where, where's the data, right? So what things do you want to look at at the same time and what's most relevant? So now you have the data. And then, you know, think about how does the AI algorithm, you know, how, how do we build it now? How does it use this data um, to answer that question for you? And the power is, again, it's a, from, from our experience, it's in the question um, entirely. So they got homework too, so we got exercises and homework. Um, and, uh, so you gotta enhance your awareness of immersion. And what do I mean by that? Um, I think that one of the things that's difficult to get a computer to have, like a person does, is intuition, right? So intuition, like gut feelings, or um, and what intuition might actually really be is our subconscious ability to sort of master this immersion, emergence, right? To sort of understand all these bits of information going around at once, we process them, we have feelings about things, and it really comes down to this intuition. And I think that if we understand our own intuition more, if we understand how to distill information better, right, or we try and evolve it, it becomes so much easier to teach a computer. So teacher, so you're talking to a computer, or I guess you're not talking to a computer, but you're, or whatever. So I'm talking to a computer, and the computer, I basically want to understand, you know, how are people feeling, right? And so unless I understand that feeling is associated with tonality and body language and all these little subtle things, what am I going to do for the computer, right? So you have to, the idea is that we enhance every levels of these immersion, become more spatially aware. That means that, are you aware at a certain time of day where the sun might be? Are you aware which way the water flows on the sidewalk? Just spatially aware in general. How, how warm is it outside? How cold is it? Was there fog in the morning? And it's very small things to do, but the idea is, is that you're tapping in and you're trying to practice looking at more information at once and to see what's, what's relevant and what's not. Uh, more emotionally aware, that's how do people respond to certain things, the energy levels, right? Um, you know, thinking about interactions between people in general and how they, they, what information they receive the most and things like that. Intellectually aware, um, not just like having sort of one idea and then all these other ideas, but then never looking at them again. Having awareness of, you know, ideas that are contending, contemporary ideas, historical ideas, what are, what's new, what's not, right? Looking for patterns there. And then more self-aware, and as somebody said diet earlier. That's when we talk about the immersion of self-awareness. So what are the things that you do um, that make you feel good, make you feel bad, right? Um, things you eat, stuff like that, uh, habits. So I think that understanding this will actually assist anyone who wants to build an AI and wants to decrease that entropy. It has to have access to the right uh, data to be able to detect immersion emergence, right? It's not just like take all the data and you can find things, because it's ridiculous sometimes to think that, you know, a data set, they can't all contain the information you need to, it can't just work magic, right? There's very key pieces of information, and I, I guess what I'm trying to show here is, if we understand our own uh, sense of emergence, our own ability to process all this information, um, if we get in tune with that, it'll be help, it'll be better to imprint that on a computer. Thank you. Are there any questions for Rob? Basic question that I asked before. Are you willing to make this slide deck available? <laughs> yeah, we can make this one available. Um, we'll put out an email address.
Um, because uh, things started to click in Calgary. It's where it started. So uh, uh, when Peter and I, the co-founder, um, when we started White Whale, it was really at the, actually the worst time ever. It was 2015, right in the middle of a recession. And I graduated with a physics degree, um, which wasn't doing well at the time. Uh, and anyway, so what we did is we, I guess we just started thinking about ways that we can tailor these concepts and things like in graph theory uh, to solve just one, one problem, which at the time was in health and wellness. And things kind of expanded uh, from there. We didn't have a lot of insight into uh, what was going on in the rest of the industry. Uh, machine learning was something that was very new. Uh, Power BI was in its beta, and we still had used that. I remember being blown away when Pete showed me it. And we tried to tape uh, Power BI together with our own little side service, trying to create today what we call DC, which is our actual platform. Um, but yeah, it was pretty instrumental in doing that. And uh, things grew, and then we just, uh, yeah, I guess we just kept thinking about you know the, the theory behind it more, and we kept, and that's how it sort of evolved, is we really cared about the value, and uh, we really cared about the AI, so. Uh, what kind of uh, clients do you have, and what kind of business problems do you solve? Well, um, so the kinds of clients we have, the, like our biggest part of the portfolio is in the energy space, um, oil and gas, and then uh, health and wellness is another one, and then sports. Um, but you know, just to, for one of them, so in the case of uh, of energy, what you're really trying to do is is you're trying to optimize the use of resources, and not everything is like uh, is basically the ingredients to oil and gas don't. It depends how you put it all together. So your different resources, at what time you use them, at what rates you use them, can all affect the outcome. And so there's a million ways to operate, say, a SAD field, but they're saying, what's the best way um, to operate it? And so what we do is we have the AI understand you know, immersion and basic, uh, basically look at, here's how everything interacts and here's what information affects other things. And then we're able to model things, so one being production. So we build a model that says, it understands how the inputs to the well um, influence the amount of oil that comes out. And once you have that, you then ask the model, you say, well, try all possible ways of running this thing and tell me the one that's the best, right? And then you have a whole bunch of those. And, you know, uh, in almost all, you know, virtually all examples, it's about reducing entropy, though. It's about you're providing them with information. A lot of time it's insight into forecasting, revenues, like budgets and things like that. Um, but a lot of other times, too, is just about understanding who the demographic is, the emerging choices the consumer's making and things like that. What that do? Maybe there's someone over here, sorry. So in your homework, basically, you, uh, you told us uh, what to do, basically, to be more spatially aware, emotionally aware, basically, to be more conscious of ourselves and our surroundings. How to do it? <laughs> Practice. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's just practice. So, like, I mean, I think they're they're in a good order as well. Um, so, I think spatially, where's the easiest one ever want to think of? Like, like and, I, and I have read something on this, and I tried. It's very difficult actually to have a sense of where you are just spatially. You know, at what time of day, where things might look like. You walk in a building, things get turned around. Um, it's very difficult to, to process that part. I think with the emotional awareness, um, you know, I, I think it's just about taking more time to look for nuances in people's body language, their tonality, uh, things like that, and just understanding how people respond differently to different things. And um, in this way, there's better ways of communication, which is what are the best ones, right? What are the things that people, you catch them stressing about, right, or things like that, um, that they might not even know, nervous tics, stuff like that. Um, you know, intellectual aware, I think, I don't think that should be a problem for anyone here, but I just, uh, I know for, for myself, it's a bit of a problem um, when, there's so much things going on, and it's just difficult to know, you know, where the value of their focus is sometimes, and that's difficult. And self-aware. So on the device level, no. Um, currently, all of our services, uh, though they can be put into real time, they all go uh, through the cloud, um, just through the platform. But we don't do anything on the edge. Uh, yeah. No, yeah, no sensors, just the data. Yeah, yeah. I'd say in 
virtually almost all cases, the client has the data. We're pretty much assisting with, with known data. But sometimes what we can do, if there's, say, two engagements with the two different clients, one of them is collecting all the data, they should be, and the other one might be missing a lot of data, but at least we know sort of what to look for. Thanks, I don't know if I know what GAN data is. What's GAN data? Oh yeah, I'm not a fan of that because why fill it in at that point? Just fill it in later. So you mentioned that you and Peter started this about 2015, so you have been doing this four years. How do you develop your intuition um, to have a process that you call? I'm curious about what your process is. I've, I, I've heard that an approximate answer to the right question is better than a precise answer to the wrong question. So mm. with the process around developing the right question, I think that it's about gathering information from the client, um, and that's really what it comes down to. Is we, we really don't know until then, and we just we we try and listen as much as possible off the start. Um, and then the other thing we want to do is we want to make sure that whatever uh, we're supposed to do, it has to be in the realm of being achieved. Because we we really uh, certainly we can't build something that doesn't work. Um, and so a lot of times what we do is we just we try and make it very painless to at least start, and. Uh, and just try something small that's a quick win and just build up the confidence and understanding of what's going on and then it has to be tangible you can do like really amazing theoretical things and all these insights but if it doesn't make it to somewhere on the front line where at a, some part of the process gets changed then it just sort of lives there and it's just really cool but yeah how long was the longest project it took you to figure out what the question was Elon mentioned one day it took years to develop the question to answer what rocket to build to get to Mars. So um, honestly, we're, we're, we say three weeks is like the is the longest that will take before we um, move on, or we just say like maybe we don't understand it. We try and gather more information on it, but I think that there's so many steps. We don't necessarily know that we have the best question, but we have a question that at least will bring demonstrate value. And in that process, as we gather more information, um, we can hone in on how to make things better or potentially a different question to ask. But we, in, in the sense of, you know, we almost want it to be obvious. And a lot of times, some of the things they people want are obvious. They just seem difficult to do. And we kind of go for those ones too. It is fake news. Uh, it's a perfect example, right? Where you have this emergence of information. People are aligned in different ways. They're polarized on certain subjects because they're given information um, that is not necessarily true. So it already is, unfortunately, and it shouldn't be. If anything, it should do the opposite, right? And it should be seen as a source of truth um, rather than you know increasing entropy. Can we take one more question? general <laughs> scope. Uh, so uh, the, what we're trying to do is we're trying to enable people that, because we focus on the questions, we're trying to enable people that might not have the programming expertise or technical background, but they understand what information is relevant to, pr to predict something. They understand a certain business or things like that. And we're trying to get in there and so that the user competency um, required, uh, like technically speaking, is much lower and the barrier that's stopping people from pursuing these ideas and products, which can be very costly, take a lot of time, you gotta build a whole company to build these things. Um, we're trying to take that away. And the way that we think of Deep Sea, our platform, is it's sort of what we, if we had it to start, we would have built everything on it. Because it's sort of tailored for a way for us to build a product in a box. It's like an assembly line for machine learning. So we have a whole bunch of different algorithms, some open source, some of the ones we designed, all available, and it's just data to models to you know, decision interface. And uh, we don't, we do some of the stuff uh, in terms of research. We look into that, but, but uh, 
really we just use the same protocol almost every time, which is all the algorithms combined. We had one more question. Uh, so when you get a data set, say from the client regarding certain subject, how do you identify if there is bias in it? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And so our, one of the things we always do is we, we, if we can, we only use objective data. Um, so example, like a, a scan time uh, would be an, an objective piece of data, right? Mm -hmm. But if you said, you know, what was at a score of one to five, how did you rate this class? Uh, we can't we can't really use data that much like that. So I, I kind of feel like it's almost at a last resort where we really look at data that might have bias in it. And generally speaking, we're looking for empirical, physical observables um, because that also ties into the idea of emergence because physical uh, systems are the things that truly embody this emergence. So that's what we look for.